Hi guys and welcome to week two. I wanted to jump on and do a quick video to talk about some of the key ideas and concepts from chapters four and five in your textbook that talked about documentation, um, collecting and recording that data. Uh, I assume you read it and that you have a general understanding. So I thought I'd dig in on a couple of the key ideas. Uh, one thing I don't love about the book is how it explains um, narrative records, anecdotal notes and jottings. Um, I can tell you I have never written a narrative report about a single inst instant the way that they talk about it in the text where you've written, you know, three to five paragraphs about, you know, a five or ten minute activity that a student did. Um, I assume that there are some rare instances where you would need something like that if you were documenting looking for like an IEP or trying to get a student additional support. Um, but in general, what they call jottings are what I refer to as anecdotal notes. Um, basically, it's recording stuff that's happening in your classroom as it happens, um, capturing something special that a student did, and um, or just something that they have mastered that you've been watching for them to master, or an example of when they've failed and how they failed and what they were doing when they failed. So for me, the strategy that worked best for me was a clipboard. So um, I just made like a made up one. <laughs> Uh, my boys' names are Will and Caleb. You'll hear their names throughout this course. Um, so Caleb on 8.23 during math, one-to-one uh, -one correspondence, counting bears during centers. If I know that one of the skills that I'm looking for is one-to-one -one correspondence in preschool, then if I see a kid doing it, I want to write it down so I have the date and what they were doing when they did it. Um, one-to-one -one correspondence is when you have a number of objects, um, the kid touches each object um, as they go and counts them. So uh, then I would take this to Caleb's folder and um, inside each of their portfolios, I keep a piece of paper to uh, stick these down on. I had um, multiple clipboards with, uh, I liked post, um, like mail labels for me, that worked better for me. Um, sometimes I used post-it notes if I didn't have that available and then I just stuck it in there. So I knew, um, I made sure that I put the date, I made sure that I put a little bit of information about what was going on around it and then I had it right there when I needed it. If a kid has an aha moment and you wanna capture it so you can share it with parents, you can document it later, um, having something quick and easy. Uh, there's also newer systems that you can use, technology to help you keep track of all that. Um, setting it up takes some time. Um, one that's often talked about in education is notability. Um, you can create class lists, you can organize it lots of different ways. Um, it's a, apparently a very user-friendly app. I am not an Apple person. Tons of educational software is on Apple's uh, Notability and Grow, G-R-O app, are both designed specifically for teachers to um, take notes, create digital portfolios, etc. cetera. Um, I use OneNote. Uh, OneNote is from Microsoft Office. It's part of your Office suite. If you have a higher-end Office suite, uh, you can create folders. You can create class lists. You can put any information. Each child can have their own folder in your um, when you're in there, and then you can put any anecdotal notes as you go from your phone into there, specifically into their little tag, um, and that would automatically capture the date and time. And then you just have to make sure that you included. Um, you know, whatever center they were in, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, post-it notes, old school, mailing labels, anecdotal notes, capture it when you see something that a student is doing um, that you you know you're going to be looking for, capture something that they have a failure and how they deal with that failure. That's another important thing you can capture. Um, and when you're getting to know your students, like at the beginning of the year, I had a lot of anecdotal notes or what our text would call jottings about what the students liked, what they didn't like when I was trying to get to know them so that I could gather more information about them and be able to meet their needs better. Checklists, I love checklists. So I uploaded to the student website, to your uh, to our Moodle page, uh, information about, it's uh, from, I think it's actually from DC Public Schools, but it's all of the Fountas and Pinnell guided reading levels and then it has questions and things you're looking for for students to be doing at each one of those levels. So uh, again you can download this from the website. 
So for a level E, these are the reading behaviors that you're going to teach or you're looking to observe. So if I was teaching, uh, level E is like a late kindergarten, early first grade level uh, reading text. So it tells you all the things you're looking for when you're reading with students at that level. So I'm going to read a couple of them to you. Reads for meaning, but checks with visual aspects of prints, letters, sounds, and words. Recognizes many words quickly and automatically. Tracks print with eyes, except at, um, at points of difficulty, so they're not pointing to every word. Uh, Rereads to self-monitor and self-correct phrasing and expression. So you would have this checklist printed out. And you would have the students' names up above for each guide, for your guided reading group. So in your guided reading group, you're going to be looking for the students to be exhibiting these behaviors. And then you're going to be looking for, um, you'll be checking them off as they do them. And then if they're not doing them, you'll put, I usually use like an always, sometimes, never. Or if I was just looking for, if they ever did it, I just put a check so I knew. And then I would look through this after that guided reading lesson was over. I'd have an, uh, an immediate thing to look at. For I notice that none of my kids are rereading when they make a mistake. They're just plowing through. So then I know for my next mini lesson with that guided reading group, that can be something I can focus on that will benefit my students. And then just so you can have an idea what a level E book look, looks like, this is a beginning reader from Scholastic, and it's Chicken Little, and it's a just right book, and it's so nice. It's a level E. Uh, they tell you on the back. Uh, a lot of the Scholastic books are leveled with Fountains and Pinnell levels because Scholastic uh, publishes a lot of Fountains and Pinnell materials. So Chicken Little, I'll just read you a page so you can get an idea of what you're looking for. They saw a fox. The sky is falling, said Chicken Little. Oh no, said the fox. Come in my cave to be safe. So students are supposed to be reading with Fluency, they're supposed to be reading with expression, and then all of that is captured on your checklist. So the next time you go back to that group, you can say, oh, the, these students aren't doing X, Y, Z. The other thing your chapter talked about was the importance of work products. So I'm using my kids again. Will is crazy about Minecraft. And so this is a book he worked on over the summer, and he also likes chapter books. So he is going into second grade. And so this was a between first and second grade level writing, and it is super long. So it's called the Never Nether, if you don't know about Minecraft. The Nether is like the other world. The Nether Adventure by Will. So he knows, and this is not a surprise because he's going into second grade, he knows that books have titles and that the author puts their name on the front cover, and it also has an illustration. He also knows about chapter books, and you're going to see that in just a second. When you open a book, the next page says the title again. He did that again. That's a lot of understanding about print and about books themselves. And then he made a chapter book. So this is The Monster Attack. Now, The Monster is spelled M-O-G-S-R. So right there, I know that he's going to need some help sounding out um, two syllable words and getting all of those sounds in there. Monster is one of those words you can sound out. And then I'll let you look a little bit. I'll just read a little bit of this page. One day, E-N-O, day, there was one boy and one girl. The boy name was Will and the girl name was Cat. Uh, they was in the nether with lava. There was lava everywhere. Cat said, I am scared. Don't be scared, said Will. It is fine. So I'm going to hold this up so you can see it a little better. So uh, obviously he needs a lot of help with spelling and that sort of thing. He needs help with punctuation. Uh, he needs help using those quotation marks and that sort of thing. But he has a ton of knowledge and understanding about how a book works. He knows that chapter books have chapters, that they have multiple characters, that they have, um, that the chapters have different titles. So then they, they go on this huge adventure through the nether. He's got, this chapter is two pages. There are ghosts. Then his friend Drew comes to help. Chapter two, Drew came to help. 
and it goes on. He shoots a bow and arrow, and then they fight the pig man, and then there was a portal, and they went home. The end, which is another um, idea you get from reading books. But the ender dragon was angry. He was angry. <laughs> Got a little confused here. Uh, he wanted to get Will, Cat, and Drew. And then on the back of his book, he shows a lot of understanding about what authors do on the backs of their covers. So this is the next book in the series and the next book in the series. Um, book two is The King Creeper and book three is The Last Hero. So he knows a lot about books that you can get a lot of information from students' work samples. Um, way more than if you gave him a worksheet and you asked him questions about what a book looks like and what are the features of books and looking at, um, whenever you can, using a work, student work sample is gonna be much more powerful than a worksheet any day of the week. Um, there's some stuff that's easy to quick and capture with a worksheet and give you information that you can use to plan instruction. But if you have the time to dig into um, their writing, if you have time to dig into projects that they're doing, it gives you a to listen to them reading. Those types of activities are going to give you a deeper understanding of who they are. And in you know a quick book or the example in the textbook, it was like a student project and there were 10 or 15 different things that the student showed understanding of that, again, is hard to capture. So think about using student work samples to, to capture where a student is to give you ideas about um, what to teach next. This has tons of places that he needs assistance and um, support, but it also gives you an opportunity to celebrate his strengths and celebrate what he understands already about books. Um, seriously, download these checklists. It will make your life so much easier. I use these in my classroom in the Bronx. I use them in my classroom in uh, kindergarten and first grade. Um, if you can have a focus for your mini lesson, you're going to be better off. And this will give you a focus for your mini lesson. Um, there are lots of other things you can focus on that you can get data from your students for your mini lesson when you're talking about reading and writing. Uh, when you're talking about reading workshop particularly, um, you can have a phonics lesson. If there's a particular sound that you want to focus on or a particular sight word you want to focus on, but if you want to talk about the reading skills they need, this will give you a place to start from. So I hope that that is helpful and I hope that um, you guys have another great week this week. Thank you so much.